Happy Epiphany Eve, if there is such a thing. This year, Epiphany will fall tomorrow, Thursday, January the 6th, 2022. And I thought it would only be appropriate, since that is uh, the day of Epiphany this year, that the study that I would do tonight would focus on the visit of the Magi in Matthew 2. I spoke a few weeks ago about the popular and familiar Christmas carol, We Three Kings, and, uh, and walk through that and the significance of each gift. But today I want to talk uh, again about this visit of the Magi and, and ask and hopefully answer a few questions about um, the circumstances surrounding their visit to the Lord on that, uh, that fateful day when they did just that. But before we do, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful season which is coming to a close as we move forward in the church calendar year. But Lord, we want to remember the lessons that are there to be learned by this story and, and the way it applies to us in our everyday lives, even 2,000 plus years later. We thank you for those individuals, whoever they were, wise men, magi, some call them kings from the East, who made the effort, uh, went to the extraordinary effort of traveling for probably two years in some sort of entourage, looking for the one whose birth was told, foretold to them in the star that they saw rising from where they were in the East. Lord, uh, thank you again for their <clears throat> tenacity, for their determination, to do nothing more than to, to find and worship and adore and to honor this one who was born King of the Jews. Father, this day and throughout this new year, may we make it our life's mission as well to look for Jesus wherever he is to be found in our culture. We know that he said he would be wherever those are who are hungry or naked or sick or imprisoned or homeless. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to look for him there, to do what we can to seek to find him there and to honor him by the way we treat those with whom he identified himself. When he said, in as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. Lord, help us to look for Jesus. Help us to look for him, not just in the down and out, but also to look for him in the up and out, who have tasted all the goodness that earth can offer and found it to be unsatisfying, or at best only temporarily satisfying. Those who know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there has to be something else. There has to be something more to life than just the accumulation of things and of friends and of fame and of wealth, that there has to be something that will satisfy this seemingly insatiable need that you have placed within them. Lord, we know that that need can only be filled by you yourself. You have shaped that vacuum in their hearts, in each one of our hearts, in such a way that only you will fit in that place. Help us, Lord, whether we're dealing with those who are up and out or down and out or middle and out, to, to find a way to demonstrate your love and your grace and your mercy and to share the good news that the King of Kings has come, the Prince of Peace has come, the Wonderful Counselor has come, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father has come in the form of a little baby. We know all that you went through, Lord, and we'll talk about that as the year goes on, as you ministered, as you taught, as you dealt with those who were in opposition to you, as you healed the sick, and, and as you died for our sins, and rose from the grave, and ascended to the right hand of the Father, where even now you are praying for us as we pray to you. Father, help us today to celebrate 
the tenacity and the courage and the determination of these wise men, whomever they were, or were from wherever they came, Lord, they came looking for you. Help us to, to honor them and celebrate them and to seek to imitate them in their determination to worship and honor you in all that we do and say here two millennia later. And may you be honored and glorified by all that is said here and by the thoughts of our hearts and our minds as we contemplate these men and what they did and why they did it and how that should impact us. And we'll give you the praise, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for praying with me. In Matthew 2, beginning at verse 1, we read these words. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of this, his word today. Amen. Tomorrow, as I said, is the traditional day of Epiphany when the visit of the Magi is remembered. In Merriam-Webster's dictionary, uh, Epiphany is defined when it is capitalized as the day which is observed as a church festival in the commemoration of the coming of the Magi as the first manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles or in the Eastern Church uh, in commemoration of the baptism of Christ. It's also defined as an appearance or a manifestation, especially of a divine being. And it's usually a sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of something, or an intuitive grasp of reality through something such as an, as an event, usually simple and striking event, or an illuminating discovery, a realization, or disclosure, or a revealing scene or moment. To Christians, of course, however, Epiphany means the revelation of the divinity of Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the arrival of the Magi, who were non-Jews at the house where the baby Jesus was living. As I discussed earlier in one of these times together, the three gifts represented the kingly nature of Christ, which was the gift of gold, divinity of Christ, which was the gift of frankincense, and the suffering servant mission of Christ, which was represented by the myrrh. Now, of course, we do not know how many magi there actually were. There may have been as few as two or as many as hundreds some have said even thousands who made the journey. Uh, what we do know from scriptures is that they came from the east and that they came for the express purpose of worshiping the newborn king of the Jews. Isn't it interesting that to Mary and Joseph, Jesus was introduced by the angel as one who would be the son of God and one who would save his people from their sins. But to the shepherds, he was introduced as a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, or a Messiah, 
the Lord, and that he would be found bound like a paschal lamb and lying in a manger. These signs would symbolize to the shepherds that he was born to be a sacrifice. But to the Magi he was introduced by the rising of a new star, which to them symbolized that he would be a king, and specifically a king of the Jews. Now, no offense intended, but did the Magi visit every newborn king that they got word of? Probably not, because that would have been all they ever did if that was the case. But this particular king was different to them. I wonder why. As we know, kings are not usually born a king. They are born a prince. Unless perhaps the reigning king passes away while the newborn king is being born, then the, the newborn is, is not a king but a prince. But the Magi said they had come to worship the one who was born the king of the Jews. He was born already the king. Now, of course, this would have been the case because all of the previous kings of the Jews had passed away. And if there was going to be a true king of the Jews who was not appointed by uh, as a Roman vassal, as Herod was, then it was going to have to be a brand new baby king. <laughs> but you can imagine the difficulties such a situation might create if a, if a baby was born as a king under normal circumstances. All sorts of political intrigues have occurred in similar situations. In such cases, being a newborn king might also be a death sentence. But this newborn king was different, although if Herod had had things his way, they wouldn't have, wouldn't have been so different because he would set out to make sure that this newborn king did in fact die, but Thankfully, we know after the fact that he was unsuccessful in doing so. But several questions have come up for me throughout this holiday season as I have thought about the visit of the Magi. One question is, why didn't Herod go with the Magi if he really wanted to worship him? Well, obviously, we know the answer to the second part of that question is that he had no intention of worshiping him. He was determined to kill him instead. But even as a pretense of going to worship him, to him, why didn't Herod go to find out for himself where the child was? Why didn't he go along with the Magi on their quest? Was he just too busy to be bothered with such trivialities? Was he afraid of what might happen to him along the way? Once the baby had been identified, perhaps. Was he afraid that the people would rise up and revolt against him once they knew that their rightful king had been born? Or maybe he was just lazy and didn't feel like going himself. Or as I often tell my family, when a plot takes an unexpected turn or twist in a movie or a TV show that we're watching and something obvious is left undone, I just tell my family, eh, it was in the script. <laughs> well, in a very very real way it was in the script for Herod to do what he did. Then another question arises in my mind. We're told that Herod assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together to tell him where the baby the Messiah was to be born. Well, if all the chief priests and the scribes knew that these magi had come looking for the one who was born king of the Jews, why didn't they go along with the Magi to find this newborn king? After all, they had the most to gain by his birth. If he was to be their newborn king, were they afraid of ruffling Herod's feathers? Very likely so. Herod was notoriously jealous and protective against any would-be rivals to his throne. And if they went with the Magi, they might be perceived by Herod as trying to set up some sort of a coup d'etat against him, and he would have had them all put to death. Or maybe, maybe they were just disgruntled that the arrival of their own newborn king was revealed to these Gentiles first and not to themselves. After all, they were supposed to be the spiritual and ethical leaders of the people. Why wouldn't God reveal the Messiah's arrival to them first instead of these outsiders, these unclean ones, these heathen from another part of the world, not even from Judea? Did they simply refuse to believe 
that God might actually work this way? Was it just a simple matter of wounded pride or self-aggrandizing pride that they sat back and pretended that this so-called star meant nothing at all? Then another question arises in my mind. Why didn't any of the townspeople of Jerusalem, who we are told were troubled along with Herod by the arrival of these magi looking for their newborn king of the Jews, why didn't they go along with the magi to find their newborn king? Were they too afraid of upsetting Herod or incurring his wrath? Very possibly. Were they just too busy with their everyday lives to make the 20 mile or so trip to Bethlehem just in case the Magi and their own chief priests and scribes were right? Or in all three cases, was it just because they hadn't seen or noticed any new star and as it was, the Magi could not even point it out to them at the time. Apparently it had either gone dark or stopped shining or been obscured from their sight for some time, or maybe it only appeared for a, a short period of time when they first saw it and then disappeared, but it was there long enough for them to know that something on a cosmic scale had just occurred in Judea. Then it disappeared. We don't know how long it had been since they had last seen it, but they couldn't point it out at the time, and for those who in this day and age, we are so scientifically driven. If you can't point it out to me now, how I just have to take your word that you saw it? You know how uh, unlikely people are to believe anything under those circumstances today. Were things that much different back then? In the absence of an actual visible star to back up the Magi's story, perhaps nobody was willing to believe that any such king had actually been born. As it turns out for Herod, the Jewish religious leaders and the people alike, the arrival of the Magi and their quest to find this newborn king were maybe just a momentary blip on their radar screens. Here today, gone tomorrow. Out of sight, out of mind. Oh yes, Herod perhaps did send a contingent of spies to follow the Magi and find out where the child was. But maybe he didn't even do that, because it seems like it wasn't until after the Magi refused to return to Herod that he got so angry and decided to just kill all the babies born in Bethlehem in that time frame. <clears throat> we are told that the Magi were warned by an angel in a dream not to return to Herod, but rather to simply go home another way, and that's what they did. As for the priests and the scribes and the people in general, perhaps a few of them took a mental note of the time frame of his birth, but then again only a few of them would even be alive long enough to see Jesus begin his ministry 28 years later. The Gospel of John declares in John 1, 11, that he came into his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. These magi were the first to match that description of all who did receive him. They were the first, then, to, to have the right to become children of God. These heathen foreigners, who were not even Jewish by practice, let alone birth, were the first to receive the Lord. When he received them, they received him. The shepherds came and looked and were amazed, and, and we are told they made known the saying that had been said concerning the child. But the Magi, when they came... They worshipped and they honored him. We're told they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, we are told. Now, of course, we know that God had all of this calculated into the events that took place surrounding the birth of his son. God knows human nature. After all, he created it. He knew that people and leaders and kings would respond just the way they responded. 
bruised egos or maniacal tendencies or cynical preoccupation with the mundane rhythms of life all considered, God knew how each one would react and respond to the news that these magi brought. It was all part of his master plan to fulfill scripture so that Jesus would be readily recognized as the Messiah by those who dared to look into those prophecies about him. But what about us today? Here we sit 2,014 years later. And what are we doing regarding the king of the Jews born in Bethlehem? Do our kings and presidents and prime ministers go out of their ways to honor and worship him and bow at his feet and give him gifts? Do they acknowledge his kingship, his deity, or his sacrifice? Do they perceive him or the worship of him, on the other hand, as a threat to their grasp of earthly power like Herod did? Do our religious and spiritual leaders take time to go where he is? That's another message in itself. To acknowledge him and to present him to his people as the king and the promised one that he truly is? Or do they avoid the subject because even today he doesn't come in the way that they wanted him to? Or even worse, because his arrival on the scene might actually upset the fruit basket of spiritual authority in their little world. And what about the people today? Here, only 12 days removed from the big day of Christmas, celebrating his birth, have we simply gone back to the daily routines and rhythms of everyday life? Too busy to make time for joining in the quest to see him, to know him, to honor him, or to worship him? Are we really that different from those people who lived 2014 years ago? I think not. In fact, I fear not. One more question remains in my mind today regarding this whole account, and that is, where are the Magi of today? Where are the ones who are looking for a sign that he has come? Where are the ones who have perceived that he has arrived? Where are the ones who have dropped everything and made it their life's quest to seek him out and to find him? Where are the ones who come prepared to honor him with their gifts, acknowledging his office of king, his essence of divinity, and his purpose of redemption? Where are the ones who are asking the troubling questions, the questions that trouble kings and presidents and prime ministers and, and all the people with them? Questions like, where is he who is born the king of Jews? Where is the Messiah? Where is the God who saves? Where is Yeshua? Where is Jesus? Are we not to be those people? Are we not to be the ones to declare we have seen his sign and have come to worship him. Are we not the ones who are called to make it our life's mission to find him and follow him, to follow his light wherever it leads us, and to encourage others to join us in the quest, whether they join us or not? I wonder where are the magi of today? Are you one? There's an expression that I have seen and heard many times, and I've quoted it many times, and it's very true. Wise men still seek him. Are you seeking him? Let's pray. Father, I believe this is your message for us today. Help us to ask and answer these questions. Most importantly, to ask ourselves, are we being faithful to the model set before us by the Magi of determination, tenacity, curiosity, and a willingness to humble ourselves, to exert ourselves for the purpose of seeking and finding and worshiping you through Jesus. Help us, Lord, 
to be faithful to that pattern that those magi set for us 2014 years ago that we too may honor him by the gift the greatest gift that we have to give which is our lives our ourselves our bodies as living sacrifices as Paul called them speak to us and Lord speak through us help us to ask those loaded questions that make people squirm where is Jesus where is Jesus in our government where is Jesus in our personal lives where is Jesus in our financial lives where is Jesus in the way we relate to our friends and our families and our neighbors and even in the way we relate to our enemies where is Jesus we have seen his sign it's the sign of the cross we know he's been here and we're looking for him help us Lord to continue that quest and to encourage as many others as possible to join in that quest until we do see Jesus face to face. Then we too may bow and give him honor and worship and praise. And we will give you the praise even now in anticipation of you answering this prayer. Amen and amen. God bless you. Happy Epiphany Eve and happy Epiphany tomorrow when the day arrives. Have a blessed evening in the Lord. Bye-bye.